Welcome to Engineered Gene Drives, Regulatory and Policy Considerations. This is a webinar series brought to you by the Gene Convene Global Collaborative, and, and I'm glad you could join us. My name is Hector Kamada. I'm, along with my colleague David Abrocta, will be hosting and moderating the series. Now, before our speaker, Dr. Martin Lim, Lemma begins his presentation. I'd like to tell you about the Gene, uh, Gene Convening Global Collaborative. For those of you who regularly attended these webinars, I hope you'll bear with me for repeating this information. The Gene Convening Global Collaborative it is an initiative within the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. It's the result of FNIH's long-time involvement in the vector-borne disease space. So we at GeneConvene see that there is the potential of genetic biocontrol and gene drive technologies specifically to contribute to reducing and even eliminating vector-borne diseases like human malaria, for example. And of course, other urgent public health challenges However, this potential still has considerable uncertainty. If we explore these technologies responsibly, we can evaluate their efficacy and safety and see if, in fact, these technologies can fulfill their potential and the benefits that people have claimed for them. The Gene Convene Global Collaborative works to advance the safe and ethical rigorous exploration of gene drive and other genetic biocontrol technologies. We do this by trying to anticipate emerging issues and to help the development of guidance and best practices through consensus building. One of our goals is to offer accurate information, advice, and technical support so that we can foster responsible approaches to research and governance of gene drive and other genetic bike control technologies for public health. This webinar series this is part of the effort. I encourage you to learn more about the Gene Convene Global Collaborative by visiting fnih.org forward slash Gene Convene. We've also created the Gene Convene Virtual Institute, which is a knowledge resource that collects, tracks, organizes, and shares the latest about gene drive, from scholarship and research to media reports to policy and regulatory documents. We hope to make the Virtual Institute a resource where those interested in gene drive and genetic bike control can come and learn about the classes of these technologies. To help you keep up with the accelerating activities in this space, the Virtual Institute publishes a weekly newsletter. It notifies you of, uh, and points you to new scholarship media reports so forth, related to gene drive and genetic bike control. I invite you to check it out and sign up at the Gene Convene Virtual Institute site. Also, we're on Twitter and Facebook, and I encourage you to follow us there. I'd also like to mention again that the Gene Convene Virtual Institute is still looking for a web assistant to hire on a contractor basis to develop and maintain the Virtual Institute's digital presence. So we're now in the second session of this series of five focused on regulations, policy, and governance. Last week, we had speakers on global regulatory frameworks. And this week, we'll be looking at the regional level we hope this series will stimulate much of thought and discussion and spark interest in exploring these issues further. And as, as I said last week, we invite suggestions for future topics to explore. So now for a few housekeeping items. For any technical problems, please contact FNIH events at the email address you see here. They're monitoring their emails in case you have problems the presentation by Dr. Lemma will last at most 60 minutes. At any time during the presentation, if you have any questions, please write them down using the chat function of Zoom. 
and we'll address them at the pres presentation. The session will end at exactly 90 minutes. And if there are any questions left, we'll address them offline. This webinar is recorded and will be posted at the Jing Convene Virtual Institute site, along with all questions and their, and their answers. So I now have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker, Dr. Martin Lema. Martin is an adjunct professor at the Biotechnology School of the National, Insti uh, National University of Quilmes, Argentina, with 20 years of academic experience in teaching, research, technology transfer, and entrepreneurship. He has 15 years of experience as a policymaker in agricultural biotechnology, including eight years as former director of biotechnology in the Argentine government and former chair of its National Biosafety Commission. Along with other achievements under his leadership, this commission was recognized as an FAO center of references, and it issued the first ad hoc regulation for genome editing applied to agriculture in the world. Martin has also been a delegate for Argentina to biotechnology related negotiations at the CBD, Cartagena Protocol, World Trade Organization, Codex, OECD, and FAO over the past, past 15 years. He has published over 30 technical and scientific publications in different aspects of biotechnology, including research, education, policymaking, and biosafety. Thank you, Martin, for joining us today. Are you ready to go with your presentation? Thank you, Hector, um, and hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to, to express my appreciation to Shin Convin for inviting me and the opportunity to contribute with, with some thoughts. On, the Latin, on a Latin American perspective. Uh, in order to do that, I'm going to start sharing my presentation now. Okay. So first of all, the, the contents. The, the contents of this presentation uh, will try to feature some uh, a, a Latin American perspective on the issue of uh, the regulation for gene drives. Also, uh, uh, or particularly addressing what are my, my perception of the potential challenges for the regulators in our regions and probably other regions too. And finally, uh, I have been asked to, to share some impressions on the draft that the other region has made on, on the potential regulation for chain drives, the, the draft uh, that was published by the European Food Safety Authority. Uh, in the in the short term, the, um, the EFSA has just published this um, this draft, but uh, it is not the, their experts are not available to comment on it until the, the drafting process has finished. So I, I was kindly asked by the organizers to 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 contribute with an external uh, perspective on, on that document. So that will be the the contents of this uh, of this presentation. Beginning with the Latin America. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I, 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 at this moment in time, I can report that there are very few initiatives, very few concrete initiatives in, in our region as, as to as to analyze. Um, I'm here mentioning uh, the three of them, or three or three initiatives, uh, we could say. One of them is uh, perhaps more widely known: um, the the project or the idea of using gene drives. Uh, to control the population of rodents in, in Ecuador, in, in the Galapagos, Galapagos Island. Uh, that will be um, in order to, to offer an additional and perhaps more humane way of controlling these animals in that particular territory. Although you can find uh, information online about this, this initiative, this, this, this possible project, um, I have been exchanging with regulators lately, and of course the regulators in, in, in Ecuador are, are aware of the idea and some preliminary conversations have took place, but there is still no, not an actual application. 
So nowadays the, the regulator doesn't have anything concrete to work upon. And, and therefore the, 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 the Equatorian regulations nevertheless, nevertheless are being proactive uh, in this regard. And they are taking uh, courses and, and trying to, to, to teach themselves or, re, or, or receive training as regards to these technologies. So if there is ever an, an application for, for, for uh, making a field trial or releasing this technology in, in their territory, they will be in a better position to, to assess that regulate that application. But that's as, as far as, as the thing gets. Uh, on, on the other side, in, in Argentina, the, there is a, like a very terminal project on gene drives uh, applied to animals, uh, to, to agricultural pests. And, one, one of the possible targets is the horn fly, which is a, a very important issue here in, in, in our livestock production in, in Argentina, the cattle production. Uh, and it seems not, uh, not uh, possible to, to solve it using traditional uh, techniques. So the, the, there is a, a, an academic project, a research project, that is a, a, it's just beginning to, to design a potential gene drive for this. But there is not yet a, any organism being produced, and nothing has been uh, filed to the or or sent or discussed with with Argentine regulators in this regard. And then uh, <clears throat> you may find online some information about um, about uh, Brazil. This this could be confusing. What we have in Brazil at the regulatory level is a, a, a regulation that that a couple of years ago where they um, set um, a mechanism to decide if um, organisms obtained with the so-called novel breeding technologies uh, for instance or mainly genome editing um, can be co uh, considered uh, genetically modified organisms or not under the regulatory framework so basically this, this regulation uh, may eventually uh, be used to decide that a certain uh, product that has been improved using molecular biology is not a GMO. And this um, regulation does mention uh, gene drives. So, so therefore, uh, uh, some articles are over there reporting that perhaps in Brazil, this, this, uh, uh, these uh, developments will not be considered GMOs and will not be regulated as GMOs. But, uh, Nevertheless, that's probably a, a confusion. Um, this uh, resolution has an annex that uh, indicates which technologies are more likely to render organisms that may not be considered GMO, and gene drives is not included in that particular annex. Nevertheless, gene drives are mentioned somewhere else in the resolution uh, for other purposes, like gathering information, and, and therefore uh, there could be a confusion in this regard, but uh, it's very likely that in Brazil, as in any other country that regulates GMOs, a gene drive organism will be regulated as a GMO. So that that's a that's a, it may seem too little, but that's as much as can be reported from our Latin American region regarding the regulation or potential regulation of these technologies. So now I'm turning to discuss a little bit. Uh, what could be the challenges of the regulators in our region when dealing with an application um, for a gene drive organism? And, and I put Latin America between parentheses because probably uh, many things that I'm mentioning now will also be a challenge for regulators in, in other regions. Uh, first of all, uh, of course, this product, this kind of products that doesn't resemble much the, the ordinary GMOs that uh, regulators have been assessing until now. Uh, until now, regulators has, have been working on uh, Bt crops, um, herbicide tolerant um, plants for agriculture. So now we are, we, are, we are jumping to other possibilities that for the most are not plants. So I mean, most regulators have, uh, have um, exercised the safety assessment of plants uh, and perhaps to some she, to GM animals up to certain extent, but always uh, terrestrial animals or farm animals. So we, in here we are talking about uh, organisms that are uh, for the most are not plants, are not 
agricultural organisms, I mean, they are not domesticated organisms. Uh, th there are some possibilities in the future that it could be applied to domesticated or, or organisms of, of agricultural use, but for the present projects, it's about pests. So not a domesticated organism, uh, not an agricultural organism. Um, besides, mo uh, many countries have regulatory frameworks who, who, which scope is based on agricultural organisms. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you have a scope um, a challenge in the scope when, when you present a, an organism that is not the, uh, for agricultural production. These organisms are not uh, to be released in, in an agri agricultural um, ecosystem or, or, or in an agricultural setting. Uh, they are the project that we know uh, will be released um, in, in in the wilderness or will be released perhaps uh, in, in ur urban uh, settings. There is, um, there is not a, a clear equivalent to a conventional counterpart, you know, for the, for the safety assessment of GM organisms. We have uh, always the, the so-called conventional counterpart until now. If you have a BT maze, you have a maze that um, is, it doesn't have that genetic modification, but more or less have, has the same genetics. So you, you can clearly compare between the two. In this case, it's not so easy to, to determine which is the conventional counterpart, although I'm going to mention that later. These products are not neutral to biodiversity. Uh, that doesn't mean that they are uh, necessarily harmful or dangerous to biodiversity. They, they may they may have a positive contribution to the conservation of biodiversity, but certainly are not neutral. While most of the products for agriculture that has been assessed until now uh, by regulators are basically neutral to, to biodiversity. In this, uh, these technologies are not feasible to recall, of course, once again, compared to, to an agricultural crop uh, with a same, uh, relatively simpler genetic modification, the, these products can be removed from the environment quite easily. Uh, it's not the case for the, the kind of gene drive organisms that we are talking about here. And for the time being, um, uh, the projects that we know of uh, are not intended to generate organisms that will uh, be a source of food. And, and therefore, uh, for as, or in summary, for for regulators that are acquainted to assess um, uh, organisms that have been modified for agricultural purposes or agricultural organisms, this uh, this possibility of the of uh, for gene drives take them out of the comfort zone. Although the the outside of the comfort zone um doesn't necessarily mean something bad as we see here in in the in the image we have the the so-called discomfort zone or the alarm zone is i think for most regulators if if they consider the the in, in latin american countries if they consider the issue in detail they will find it in the let's say the, the, let's say the interesting discomfort zone and um uh, outside of uh, safety or safety assessment consideration, there are some other considerations that may affect the work of, of regulators. One of them is uh, the, 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 the concerns about being the first uh, regulator or, or the first country that uh, releases one of these technologies. And uh, in many of our countries, regulators wait for other countries to make the first move or, or for international organizations to generate uh, guidance uh, before um, beginning to deregulate um, or, or approve field trials with, with novel technologies. There could be a clash between the mandate of, of different authorities uh, because until now, as I said, most regulatory framework have been um, put together for agricultural products but now we have products that are more related to health, um, a, a health, a, a public health outcome, or or preservation of biodiversity. So perhaps the the, the legal competence is in in a ministry that is not the same ministry that currently um, convenes the the biosafety commission in that country. 
once again, we are discussing, and, and I say once again, uh, because in here when I put an asterisk, I mean that the issue is not new. The issue also arises in connection with the assessment of ordinary GMOs. But once again, there is an issue ar around discussing the benefits or the effectiveness of this technology. Most of the um, regulatory frameworks that are currently in place for GMOs are focused on safety and considerations about ben about benefits are not taken into account. And that's uh, that, that is discussed if that is OK or there, it, there should be a way of considering benefits within the, the regulatory framework. Uh, so for, for these particular applications like improving public health, this discussion is going to be re revitalized. Uh, but in addition, there is the issue of effectiveness assessment because the, the regulators that are assessing the um, hazards to biodiversity or to or to ha hazards to human health through periandiac rules like, like allergenicity or things like that, they are not uh, necessarily considering the effectiveness of this technique in reaching a public health um, objective. So uh, the, the, there should be a discussion regarding if, if, the, if that effectiveness has to be assessed uh, ex ante uh, or after the product has been cleared for, for environmental release. The discussion about the alternative solutions for these kind of problems, of course, for controlling pests, we have a, a broad range of solutions. Clearly, they, they are not a silver bullet because if they were, we will be discussing this, but uh, the, 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 there's probably going to be a, a intense debate about the, ne the necessity of incorporating these technologies when there, there are another ones. And more broadly speaking, the, the issue of socio-technical resistance against uh, in, in innovations and particularly uh, biotechnology innovations, which again is not new for GMO regulators, but probably going to, to be harder for this particular product given its uh, novelty and its implications. Besides, um, regulators do not work in vacuum or isolated. They, they are also aware of ongoing, in, on, ongoing international developments. Um, we, we almost have a, a moratorium for gene drives in the last meeting of the Convention of Biological Diversity. So the, so the issue is being discussed very seriously. That was in the framework of the this of the debates pertaining the regulation of the so-called synthetic biology. So synthetic biology is a broader term, not uh, very ill-defined uh, until now. There is only an operative definition that is that is very broad. Uh, but in that context, uh, there is this um, debate, uh, specific or a specific debate about having a moratorium or, or the need of further guidance for the deployment of gene drives. And the, um, what, what is uh, particularly worrisome are those debates that mention the possibility of the gene drives to escape to different jurisdictions, I mean, to be approved for one country and then uh, escaping from that country or extending uh, the, the population of gene drive organisms uh, to other neighbor countries or to far, countries that are far away through through planes or boats. And this uh, possibility, even, even if theoretical, trigger a lot of, or enable a, a lot of um, discussion in this international fora that basically regulates the relationship between countries in terms of biosafety. Until now, we only see this kind of, um, the, uh, of debates occurring in, in the Convention of Biological Diversity. But if we look at the history of GMO, it's very likely that the, the issue will be also taken to some other uh, fora in the future. Um, then finally, um, one, of, one of the challenges probably, is, uh, most important challenges probably is going to acquire uh, capacity building or learning in terms of specific uh, knowledges that may, may be needed. Uh, as I mentioned, in, in Ecuador, for instance, they, they're already, uh, although they, they don't have a, an, an application uh, by now, 
they are trying to to improve their their um, the technical competence in this kind of technology and the implications of making a safety assessment of, of it. And then the training needs, um, again, once again, when, when I'm saying this, please take in, in mind that uh, currently regulators are quite acquainted with, with performing safety assessment of um, domesticated agricultural organisms and mostly plants. So now let's say if we, if we switch to an, an insect that has a gene drive for, for uh, eventually controlling uh, the population of that insect. Probably regulators need to learn a, a lot more about the biology of this uh, novel organ, I mean, novel for them or novel in this kind of regulatory discussions, the, the biology of the, of the organisms implied, how the gene drive constructs work uh, in within that, which is a very broad issue, what is the stability uh, of that uh, construct after the, they are released in the environment, and what about the off-target uh, modifications that may happen after the, the release in the environment? Probably regulators will need a, a refreshment on population genetics and a, an update uh, on the theory or modeling on, of population genetics to be applied to this particular problem and how and, and the current tools to monitor a, po a population in, in the field. Um, besides for strategies that are aimed at, at pest control, I mean, drives uh, aimed at pest control, the analysis um, of uh, the impact in the full web of removing uh, a particular species and uh, the comparison uh, with the other, how to compare with other control strategies that should be used as a baseline. I mean, it's not against not using any technology, it, it should be compared with, for instance, using insecticides. And although not strictly necessary to do um, a risk assessment, since regulators are usually called to, to formally or informally to also provide input on, on other aspects, it wouldn't harm that regulators in, in our region uh, receive a training or um, or, or some uh, um, uh, knowledge on uh, concepts of science communication as well as socio-technical resistance. Well, that's that's uh, what I can tell you about um, la, la, the Latin American situation. And now uh, a few, some impressions on the EFSA draft. Once again, of course, I'm not speaking on, on behalf of EFSA. It will be desirable that this this uh, this draft is presented by one of, of one of the authors, for instance. Uh, but uh, for the meantime, in the meantime, uh, I'm happy to to contribute. And if you feel interested in, in anything I say now, from now on, I I strongly uh, advise you to go to the uh, to the original document and, and read the original document. So first of all, policy considerations. The, the European Food Safety Authority received a mandate uh, of ident first of all identifying the potential risk that chin drive sorry that, that chin chin drive. Um, oh sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to minimize something here. But, so, sorry, once again, EFSA was um, EFSA received a mandate of identifying potential risks that these products may pose, um, and also to determine if uh, the the guidelines that are already published by the same organization are adequate uh, already for these products, or whether there is a need of updated guidance. But <clears throat> they they clearly clarify that the, the current mandate. Uh, doesn't include um, to develop further guidance, just just to detect if there is a gap. Uh, nevertheless, um, the, this uh, this document, uh, perhaps inadvertently, but it does contain a lot of uh, updated guidance on it. Uh, they, uh, they also had a mandate to provide technical and scientific expertise that could be used by the European communities uh, while negotiating in the Convention on Biological Diversities. And the, um, 
the scope of the document covers uh, application of sheet drives to control harmful insects, especially those that transmit uh, diseases or are agricultural pests. So why, why am I am highlighting this? Because it's not about a process in Europe developing guidance for their for their own use uh, at this until now. It looks like more like like producing some some uh, guidance or suggestions that Europe will try to convey in these international initiatives. Uh, and finally, perhaps to be used firstly by other regions. In this regard, the same document uh, recognizes that Europe has very little um, practical experience on classical biocontrol agent. It, it is stated that there has been only three releases of uh, classical, I mean, other kinds of biocontrol agents in, in Europe. So this, this, this discussion is built upon uh, theoretical considerations. Um, it, in this document, there is repeated reference that, that to the to the to the speculation that gene drives may eventually spread to to other countries from the initial country of, of release, and and therefore this is quite uh, significant if this document is going to be used for international fora, because once again. We're talking about one, one region of, of the world preparing documents to engage in international negotiations where this region will perhaps be proposing that countries will not uh, have plain sovereignty or uh, autonomy to, to decide on these releases. Uh, while in contrast, some consideration of the potential uh, um, transboundary movements uh, may uh, indulge or, or enable the, the intervention of other authorities outside of the country. And um, something, something that, uh, I mean, it's just a phrase in, in, in the document, but I think it's important. This document says that the spread or establishment of the gene drive in the target population, at least, uh, is not itself a harm to biodiversity. So, um, in, first of all, this, this document is, is excellent um, for any regulator to see because it, the, the, it contains a very detailed review on, on the state of the art of gene drives, the different kinds of gene drives that, that can be found nowadays and potential applications. So, so the first part of the document, I mean, the whole document is excellent, but the first time, which is basically a review of the state of the art, is very commendable. But then on the second part, uh, where it begins the assessment of the current guidance, it is stated that the current guidance for gene drive modified insects uh, can be made uh, based on the current uh, paradigm for safety assessment that is uh, enshrined in, in existing documents. Um, it says that the considerations that you can find in, in documents uh, already published by EFSA on the safety assessment of genetically modified animals on food from GMOs and other, other aspects are broadly accept adequate. And the guidelines may benefit just from revisions, uh, particularly on certain topics. <coughs> well, um, the, the conclusion says that the existing guidance that uh, they have in Europe and also that we have in, in, in Latin America and in other countries, uh, which is very similar, I mean, is, is uh, considered adequate on issues like molecular characterization. I put molecular characterization between brackets because depending on the, on the part of the document that you read, seems like, like the, um, the existing guidance is okay. In some other part, it, it may be suggesting that there is a need of further guidance, but at least in, in, in some parts or on the on my overall conclusion is that the molecular characterization strategies that uh, they use in Europe and we use in other countries are, are, are okay. Uh, also things like the description of the methods used the, the, the core of risk assessment, which is the hazard characterization, the exposure characterization, and finally combining that, the risk characterization, the existing guidance is okay. Um, the risk management um, guidance that we can find uh, in 
EFSA says that the risk management guidance that they have is, is adequate. There is only some reference to a special kinds of, of shin drives, um, but that reference doesn't change the, the overall idea. Also, specific things like uncertainty analysis, animal welfare, uh, long-term effects, and uh, I mean, that in those uh, particular topics, also uh, seems like the existing guidance is considered uh, adequate. Um, a, a very important part of uh, risk assessment, and particularly environmental risk assessment, is problem formulation. The document um, is, uh, speaks very extensively on, on, pro on problem formulation, but if you read it carefully, it's, it's just um, a recall of what problem formulation means. So the, nothing, nothing, nothing new, at least on the theory. So my, my personal conclusion is that they are saying that the existing approach for problem formulation is okay. The, 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 they, they are making a lot of detail about the theory, but there is nothing different now in regards to shin drives. And at most, uh, there could be special considerations regarding the, th the things that are detailed here. And, and in, in this part, for instance, is where I'm saying that although in, in this document um, says that uh, it's uh, the mandate is not the current mandate of EFSA is not providing guidance and um, further guidance may be needed in the future. Uh, by saying that the special considerations shall be shall be awarded to these topics, that that's a guidance on itself. And probably there's not much to say about this in, in the in the short term. So this this document uh, is not presented as a as a guidance patch, but in, in many in many aspects it is a guidance patch. I would like to make a special uh, reference to the issue of comparators. Uh, it, it is uh, very positive to read that the EFSA consider that. Uh, um, the, there is freedom to to use different kind of comparators depending on the issue that you are comparing between the genome, um, um, the gene drive organism, and the and the conventional counterpart. Because the conventional counterpart, for some purposes, may be the non-modified uh, insect, but for some other purposes, maybe uh, technologies used to control the insects, and particularly the repeated references to insecticide, because this. These technologies, and now is my personal opinion, it's very important that they are not assessed in vacuum. They shall be compared against current uh, or existing technologies to control insects and, and the impact that they have on the environment, particularly insecticides. Um, in, but but uh, still on the issue of comparators, I'm personally quite intrigued by the by the far by the final consideration here, where EFSA is saying that for particular purposes, uh, a suitable comparator may include things like um, insecticide treated nets or drug treatment programs. Um, I personally don't 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 see the connection because, of course, these um, te these uh, technologies are used to avoid the disease in humans but they don't have much relevance uh, as regards to controlling the vector. So um, considering the scope of, a, of an EFSA, EFSA assessment or, or the scope of a biosafety assessment, probably this, I don't see much room for using these comparators, but I think there is a lot of room for comparing against insecticides. Here, the, here you can see a list of areas where uh, um, the EFSA document is explicitly saying that uh, there is a need of updated guidance. Uh, on one, on one of them is uh, once again molecular characterization. One, once again, is between pa pa parentheses, because a, a lot is a, a lot is said about um, uh, molecular characterization in the document, but I can cannot extract ex extract anything in particular that they are saying that, 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 that there is a difference with gene drives. So depending on the on the some parts of the document are, are saying that the current provisions on molecular characterization from from the other documents that they they have now 
and we have now in, in other countries, which are very similar by the way, um, are completely okay or sufficient to make the molecular characterization. And in some other parts, it suggests that they may not be sufficient, but it doesn't say exactly how. Probably it has to do with this topic that, uh, with this issue that uh, gene drives are, are more complex in, in terms of how they work at the molecular level compared to, for instance, a BT gene. But nevertheless, the, the, the overall considerations to on which information is necessary or how to approach that information are probably always to be the same. Uh, EFSA also says that probably there is a need of more detail or, or updated guidance in regards to issues like inheritance or phenotypic stability of, of the gene drive. Um, also on how to address persistence and invasiveness of the, um, of the gene drive um, because perhaps for more ordinary or conventional GMOs until now it was um, it, it, it suffices to, uh, to consider an individual carrying the transgene, but now it's like EFSA Hello, can you, can, are you, I'm, I'm still on there? Hey, Martin, you froze a little bit, but you're back on. So ah, okay. please continue. Can, can you tell me where I froze or, or how, how long ago did I froze? A few seconds or, or longer? Five minutes ago. Five minutes? Yeah, I ah, Okay, sorry, please. Please let me know where, where I uh, where where you lost me in this problem formulation or com no go forward please. Um, so in here, did, did you get the part on comparators? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what what I will begin again from here. Yep. So. I was saying that EFSA is explicitly saying that there is a need of updated guidance in this um, in these uh, topics. Uh, as I said, molecular characterization, which um, uh, depending on how you read the documents, may or may not need updated guidance. The, the inheritance and phenotypic stability of gene drives, which of course is going to be different compared to an ordinary transgene the persistence and invasiveness. And in here, there is a discussion that need, needs to be read, read, read with detail, since uh, there is a consideration pertaining the what they call the, a selfish genetic element, having perhaps some, some uh, concerns that are not applicable to the individuals carrying, carrying the, that transgene. And uh, there is a lot of, um, um, uh, references to mathematical modeling and post-market monitoring. And this makes sense because for a BT crop, for a BT maize, uh, basically the, the most important part of, of, of the assessment are the results of the field trials. So, so the developers perform uh, several field trials, they, they gather information and they present it for the, for the assessment for commercial release. Uh, and the information for, for field trial quite suffices to the regulators. And therefore, post-market monitoring, uh, frankly speaking, for the products that are currently in the market is just nominal or symbolic. Also, the, the mathematical modeling is not so important for most uh, GMOs that we have now in the market. Uh, it, it, it has its importance for PT crops or 
crops that control pest population up to a certain extent, but, but not, not, not beyond that point. Then uh, with gene-edited um, organisms, the, the thing gets more complicated because it is anticipated by the EFSA document that the field trials are not going to be very informative and, and there's likely going to be a, um, no, no much room for or, or differentiation between a field trial and a commercial release, because since this, uh, at least for for some ver versions of gene drives, it will persist in environment and and, and transmit to to other regions. Therefore, you, you cannot have the same concept of a confined field trial as you can get with a BT crop, and therefore. Um, they, they, are, they are saying that mathematical modeling should be improved. Uh, mathematical modeling should be used as much as possible to anticipate what's going to happen before any release to the environment of, of an organism containing a gene drive. And then uh, th there could be, for instance, a, a field trial within a cage, but, but, um, but an open field trial is very unlikely to happen, or the field trial will be the definitive release, let's say. Therefore, post-market monitoring will be important to complete the information about the product that is needed and, and for enhancing the safety assessment criteria for future products. And uh, there is um, also a um, highlighted section on case-specific monitoring to identify an anticipated adverse effect. Uh, this this makes sense like a uh, case by case depending on the on the characteristics of, of the system that is being un under analysis the regulators may, may identify within the post market monitoring some specific monitoring uh, strategy or outcome that is uh, connected to that case so that that idea makes sense but it doesn't make much sense in my personal opinion to list it uh, under um, topics where updated guidance is needed because by its own nature case specific monitoring uh, strategies to identify an anticipated adverse effect is something that has to be built case by case and um, uh, in a learning by doing um, mode so uh, I, I don't see how uh, updated guidance can be uh, developed on that particular point Here we have some other um, issues where the EFSA document is saying that there is a need of updated guidance. Um, uh, so, for instance, in here um, we are they, they are like anticipating that the current guidance may be uh, limited or, or too too prescriptive. Well, once again, it's not like saying that there is no guidance at all, that they are recognizing that the guidance exists on the topics, but probably there's going to be a, more, a need of more clarification for regulators on how, how to address um, um, things like, for instance, the statistical analysis. Statistical analysis in the EFSA documents in particular is very prescriptive nowadays, so how, how to do um, the statistical analysis of data is uh, very detailed in these documents, and but that was developed for BT crops or herbicide tolerant um, crops, and therefore uh, the system here is is very different in in, in many ways. So the statistical analysis uh, guidance has to be flexibilized, flexibilized, made more flexible. Sorry, and and perhaps further guidance uh, developed for a completely different system and with that uh, i finish and, and thank you for your time and attention thank you martin uh, i invite people now to um, share their questions on the chat version um, of zoom and in the meantime i've got a couple of questions to get the discussion going um, my first question, Martin, if you could address it, is what are the prospects for developing a regional approach to gene drives 
in Latin America? Are, are you th thinking about poss possibly a formal um, organization or relying on existing coordination mechanisms in Latin America? Well, we, we, we do have different coordination mechanisms for safety assessment of GMO that can be also used for this. Mm -hmm. we, you, you have uh, at, the, at the whole level region, you have the, the ICA, the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation in Agriculture. It has a biosafety directorate and that, that biosafety uh, bureau um, frequently uh, conveys meetings. So the regulators of Latin America and also North America uh, get together and, and coordinate the, the, the scientific part of the safety assessment. And that, that mechanism is widely used, has been used over the years, it's, it's alive and it could be, could be useful for this particular thing of gene drives. They have been working lately on, on genome editing, for instance, and that helped a lot to, to start harmonizing the issue in, in our region. Uh, in addition to that, we have like sub-regional organizations that could be helpful too. For instance, in, 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 in the Southern Corn, we have the, <clears throat> The, some coordination mechanisms at the level of Mercosur uh, for, for, for coordinating uh, the safety assessment requirements and the approvals between Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. In the Central American region, they have now a, a coordination initiative for biosafety. And also the Andean region ha has its own co regional coordination mechanisms. So for instance, if there is ever a release of an organism and the regulators of the country where the application has been filed consider that uh, by the nature of the system there could be a possibility of the gene drive moving to neighbor countries this um, this cooperation uh, um, entities may be activated thank you martin our next question is from andrew roberts he says, thanks, Martin, for a very clear and insightful presentation. One of the perpetual challenges related to GM organism approvals is that broad protection goals, such as biodiversity protection, are easily agreeable. But practical decisions about exactly how to determine what specific organisms are protected and how far that protection goes, that is the definitions of harm, have been much more challenging. This has been difficult for GM crop risk assessment where the decision point is typically, if it does no harm, then it is permitted. Do you see this as becoming more challenging for uh, gene drive applications, where the decision is almost certainly going to need to weigh benefits to diverse biodiversity with associated risks? Andrew says he asks this because experience suggests that these conversations are often masked by detailed technical conversations, and certainly gene drive lends itself to, a detailed, uh, to detailed technical conversations. Okay. Um, hello, Andrew. Th thank you for the question. It's, it's quite uh, relevant. Uh, the, um, my, my personal view is it has been very difficult, uh, as you say, for, for the, the ordinary GMO experience so far to, to get the international standard or, or across the board agreements on, on how to identify the, the species to be protected or the environmental endpoints. In, in general. But then when countries face the application for a particular BT product, let's say, uh, one way or another, they, they can identify which are the relevant species or the endpoints for that particular case. So I hope in this case it will be the same. Perhaps it will be difficult to settle the issue at the level of overall discussions or general, general guidance. But when it comes to case by case um, assessment, each country uh, will be able to find a way. Having said that, the problem that is anticipated in the EFSA document is if there is a, um, a um, credible possibility of a gene drive released in one country uh, moving to other countries then we can have a problem because different countries may have dif different uh, endpoints or, or criteria for identifying endpoints. 
And while perhaps the country that has, the, has to deal with the application is interested to finish the process because they have a law mandate, let's say, on, on, on giving an answer to the applicant, perhaps the, the, the neighbor country will not be in the same hurry to identify the endpoints or not so willing to cooperate in, in that assessment. Uh, so therefore, that, that's a, a point where we can get a problem. Uh, the, the country of the application is, is moving on, is identifying the, which, which are the goals, the protection goals and, and, the, and the species of concern. Uh, but at the same time, fear that the, the pro, or consider that the product may move overseas and not getting or not being able to, to, to take decisions uh, or to take a decision based on the protection goals of the other country. Thanks, Martin. The next question is uh, actually a follow-up from the question that I asked. Uh, you had mentioned some regional entities in Latin America that could be triggered uh, or that could be used for regional coordination on gene drives. And Dave Obrachta asks, would the regional entities that you described in Latin America be triggered by evaluation of classical biocontrol agents. Classical biocontrol seems like at least a partial analog to gene drive introductions. Is it an analog in your view? Well, I'm not so personally familiar with the, that, the, the coordination for the control of classical uh, biocontrol agents, but uh, yes, we, there are. Um, uh, I think ICA also have a, another area active on that. And, and I know that my country has some, some, have some agreements with, with, uh, with other countries in order to coordinate uh, or exchange information in, in regards to that. So that, that, that is true. In addition to the cooperation avenues that we have for GMOs, uh, also the, the cooperation avenues that already exist for, for uh, the, the transboundary movement and application of um, um, classical biocontrol organisms uh, may be used. Thanks, Martin. The next question is from Moiz Khan. He thanks you also for the talk, and but asks, could you tell us more about the composition of regulatory bodies in Latin American governments? Are you satisfied that these bodies have enough technical expertise to come for the right regulations for gene drives? What can they improve in this regard? Well, my, 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 thank you. Thank you for the question. It's, it's also very relevant. My, my, my first concern will be with the legal um, scope of, of, the, of most regulatory bodies. Because once again, in, in Latin America and in other countries of the world, um, the regulatory, the, the safety commissions and, and the regulatory system was created to deal with uh, agricultural applications. And when I say agricultural applications, I say animal use in, agri use in agriculture, not, not pests. So um, uh, in, the, in the documents, uh, the laws, the regulation establishing the scope of work of the biosafety commission, usually works like uh, uh, GM crops or agricultural organisms are used, or uh, the, the biosafety commission is under the Ministry of Agriculture. And therefore, if you present them with, let's say, a, a mosquito that is modified uh, to control uh, the, the, the population of a wild species uh, that has not much to do with agriculture, and uh, the ultimate goal is to contribute with public health, um, that will make a lot of noise. I mean, uh, probably it's not going to be considered within the scope of, of this com by safety commission. They do have the knowledge, or at least the basic knowledge on how to make the safety assessment, but they, they, they may not be empowered to do it. So well, once, once one of these, uh, the one, a developer or one of these technologies wants to approach a particular country, first they must engage with policy makers and, and, and higher political authorities to, say, to, to, to have a conversation like this. Are, are you interested in this technology? If you are, we need to work with you because you need to update your regulatory framework. So the current, the, the existing bio, uh, Biosafety Commission is now able to also assess the safety of this product. So that, that's my main concern. The other things, 
<clears throat> that I mentioned about capacity building are also important uh, because there will be a lot of information about mathematical modeling. There will be a lot of information about the, or, or there should be a lot of information in these dossiers about the biology of, of, uh, of pests. And regulators are not acquainted to work with that. Uh, they are acquainted to work with, once again, maize uh, or cattle. So they, they will need to receive training on those issues that I have mentioned. That doesn't mean they cannot do it. They, they have the basic uh, capabilities to do safety assessment. It's just a, 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 an update, an update on a specific topics. Actually, Martin, I have a follow-up question on that. And that is, you know, you've got very specific recommendations for training needs. What are your, what are your recommendations for how these will be met? You know, you have specific um, bodies that you think might be able to fulfill fulfill that role, or you know who might these regulators? Well, come? well um, the, the 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 topics are very diverse, so you you cannot get trained by the same people or organization on mathematical modeling and perhaps socio technical resistance or the, the five six topics that I mentioned, the, the, those providing the, the, the content uh, are probably very, be of very diverse origin. But the, the, I think there, there is room, for instance, for Shin Kombin to, to take the initiative of developing like a training package. Uh, for, perhaps Shin Kombin can organize like modules uh, providing um, uh, training on the, these so different topics. All of the, uh, the training will be provided by different experts, but all of them together in the same place. So regulators can go to this resource and get training on the different aspects that they need to update in order to deal with, uh, with this kind of uh, product. Thanks, Martin. Um, there's a follow-up question from Andrew Roberts. He says, uh, your previous answer makes perfect sense to him. But following up on mine and David's comments, one of the issues of existing GMO regulations is that a lot of time and energy has been required to develop regulatory system, system, systems that, at least for some countries, turn out to be infrequently used. While decisions on gene, gene drive organisms will clearly be important, in my opinion at least, I don't think decisions will be frequent. Does this influence your thinking on the needs for regulatory, regulatory framework development? Well, the 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 the, the, regular, the, the update or or the or the modification of the regulatory frameworks to deal at least with one application may may, may be in the shape of a president, presidential order saying. Uh, for, for the time being, um, this uh, biosafety commission that were, runs under the Ministry of Agriculture is now entitled to also do a uh, safety assessment of, of GM mosquitoes, let's say. Uh, or there could be an agreement between the two ministries, health and agriculture and science, and sign uh, a resolution together so the, the, so the, the collaboration is established and the, the biosafety commission is empowered to do the safety assessment. Uh, it, it not necessarily means to, to develop uh, very extensive documents or, 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 very detailed, or a very detailed process. The most important part is the empowerment. And the empowerment can be, can be given uh, by a very short document signed by the appropriate authority. Okay, thanks, Martin. Um, Follow-up question from Moiz Khan. Um, if you had a slide that implied that there exists some misinformation about gene drives. Could you elaborate on this and how regulatory bodies can protect themselves against such propaganda? <laughs> well, uh, I, I think most, most regulators uh, around the world uh, have a have a training in this because there is a lot of misinformation about ordinary GMOs. So I, I trust most of my colleague uh, colleague regulators. They they 
they know wh where to where to look for information uh, to in order to to get training or or, or to perform a, a, a particular assessment uh, but the thing is they may be aware of this misinformation uh, being released in society uh, ordinary people perhaps they, their political authorities and uh, for that reason regulators may be um, more <clears throat> less prone to take a, a bold decision, like saying, "Okay, we, we will proceed and do the safety assessment," or or if the or if the, the a developer approaches a regulator in, in a particular country because the, the the developer wants to know what what could be the regulatory pathway or, or how how the application shall be handled, perhaps the regulator will not be so open because it's fearing that there could be a, a, a slashback uh, from society and from or from political authorities so i think it's not so, it's not so much a matter of of um, yielding regulators for misinformation it is about of getting the other uh, stakeholders um, a, a balanced uh, interaction with adequate information so so they allow the regulators to do their work We're getting quite a few questions now. Um, one from Delphine Thesey. Martin, you mentioned risk communication in your presentation. Did you give examples of when you believe it was it was well done? And also, what are the important criteria to do so? Okay. Hello to Delphine. Thanks for the question. Uh, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> the thing with, with risk communication is uh, frankly speaking, until now, regulators have only dealt with BT crops and herbicide resistant crops. So there is not so much risk to communicate on particular products. Uh, the, the, and, and, the, and, and there is, uh, of course, a lot of room on communicating that the technologies after passing a governmental assessment are safe. So uh, I, I'm, I do not concur much with uh, speaking about risk communication in, in terms of ordinary GMOs. But basically what we do is to communicate society that we have regulatory systems in place that are safe and, and explain why pro, pro, uh, risky products are not um, very likely to, to, to go through them. But the, the products themselves doesn't have much risk to, to be communicated. And, and as regards to Chin drives is probably the same. Uh, these products, uh, if they get an approval from, from a government to be released, uh, it's because uh, there is not much risk to communicate. But the, the society should be informed about what is this technology in general, uh, should be informed that the government is having, a, is having power on this, they are making an assessment, and the assessment was adequate, and also the very likely, as the EFSA document anticipates, there's going to be much more post-market monitoring, so the public must know that the product is being monitored all, all, all the time after release, and, and things like that. So, once again, in, in connection with communication, I wouldn't, I wouldn't read much about the theory of uh, risk communication. That, that's for new nuclear centrals and, and other kinds of things that may threaten nature, not so much for GMOs. I will read, but I will read a lot about socio sociologists that have studied communication of science and technology and how ordinary people uh, gets information about uh, science and technology. They, they have very, they, there are very interesting things that sociologists have uh, found. We do not have to reinvent the wheel. Things like how popular culture influences people, how references to certain movies or, or to certain um, Fictional stories may be very, may be very influential in, in driving people's mind to, to having a certain attitude towards a, a technological innovation or, or other attitude. Things like that, I think, are very worthwhile to be read and, and taken into consideration for, for designing a communication strategy. Thank you, Martin. We have a question from Werner Schenkel. You mentioned gene drive organisms to be not neutral to biodiversity. Could you extend on this and compare it to conventional GMOs, also such a wild species, I guess, um, GM wild species? 
Yep. Well, right. uh, <clears throat> for the GMOs that have been assessed by now and for by most regulators uh, around the world, those are uh, domesticated animals or plants to be grown in in artificial environments. So it's it's a it's a GM plant in in an agricultural field or it's a GM fish in in a in an artificial pond uh, or, or or a pool in a, in a pool. So we, this in these products is very uh, straightforward to reach the conclusion that they are not having an impact on, on biodiversity because this animal, especially in the in the case of crops, mo most GM crops are are we are talking about species that cannot live without human assistance or they cannot go out compete uh, wild plants without human assistance. <coughs> Sorry, or the traits are that are being introduced by genetic modification are very positive for, for human use, but are detrimental to their survival. Uh, that, that's for ordinary GMOs. For, for this, um, for, for, for organism carrying gene drives, <coughs> the, the, the thing is different, sorry, because there is a, an explicit purpose of affecting biodiversity. Uh, in this case, in the cases that we have now, or we can consider now, for uh, reducing the population of a, of a certain pest. Um, but once again, if we are dealing, if we are, if we are discussing about pests like um, um, organisms that are not natural to that environment, uh, invasive organisms that uh, shouldn't be there, and probably there are already other strategies in place to control them. Uh, the impact on biodiversity is not negative, it is, it's positive. If we are talking about rodents in, in island, <coughs> it's, it's about uh, avoiding those rodents to destroy the eggs of the, of the native species. And, and also it's, it's about a, a more human way of controlling the population of, of a sensible animal compared to use a, perhaps a, a poison that will give them a, an awful death. So the impact on biodiversity, of course, has to be assessed case by case, and it's a personal opinion, opinion but the, 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 the impact on biodiversity, it, it does exist, but it's clearly positive. There, there, there is room for analyzing risk hypotheses, like what, what will happen, for instance, with mosquitoes, if we wipe out the population, let's say, uh, many many mosquito transmitting diseases um, are not are not native to the countries where they are they are uh, they are ca causing trouble. They, they are invasive species that wasn't there before humans started to move things around the globe. So first of all, they are invasive species. They are being controlled with insecticides that also that do harm biodiversity in other ways. But if we consider, for instance, the the current role of those mosquitoes in the food web uh, of, of that uh, of, the, of the relevant ecosystems of course there is there is room to analyze what will happen if the technology wipes out let's say in the worst scenario or the best scenario depending on how you you see it if, if the if the if the strategy wipes out these mosquito species uh, that that will be great for human public health but what, what will happen with the with the food web that's, that, that's a, in theory or in principle, that's a valid question for a biosafety assessor. But, but I think it's a question that can be um, addressed and there are means to show that at least for, for many cases, uh, the food web will, will sustain, will, will still, uh, um, will not be harmed and, and it will continue. Martin, I have a follow-up follow question to that. Is, um, with regard to either positive impact on biodiversity by conventional GMOs, does the recent example of the uh, American chestnut GMO that is um, that is scheduled to be released or at least um, is a, is awaiting a decision by USDA, does that give us any insight into how you know those questions might be addressed with regard to gene drives. 
I mean, the, 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 well, the point, the, the point, uh, the contact points that I see is that we're talking about, uh, uh, let's say, wild species, uh, but uh, it also has a lot of intervention with humans, so, but it's not agricultural uh, species. And it's for biodiversity, it's, it, the ultimate goal is to make a positive contribution with biodiversity. So that, that's a contact point. Perhaps there's something else to learn, uh, but I'm not seeing it. Uh, I'm not seeing it right now on, on, on the fly. But perhaps we, we have this underlying discussion about um, the EPSA is very clear about this too. The, the thing that, that a transgene, uh, tra an ordinary transgene or a gene drive is dispersed in a population, that's not a harm to biodiversity or the biodiversity of, of that population or that species by itself. It could have, depending on a case-by-case -case basis, some negative outcome, but the spread of the of the transgene is not a harm on itself. That, that's an important thing. And, and probably uh, if, if the chestnut case uh, gets finally approved and, uh, and, and released, it will be like, like a, 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 um, a specific example to show that and counter those that on a very theoretical and, and very fuzzy um, rational, uh, try to convince people that the mere dissemination of a transgene uh, is, is a harm to, to, to biodiversity uh, by itself. Martin, on the topic of uh, analogs also to gene drives, Devo Brockta asks, uh, there are releases of GM mosquitoes in Latin America and release of artificially infected mosquitoes with Wolbachia to alter vectorial capacity. Do you see these as facilitating discussions of gene drive or is gene drive seen as qualitatively very dif different in the regulators that you deal with? Well, well the, 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 there are some things that may be useful. For instance, when we talk about comparators, uh, the, the EFSA document is clearly saying that the technologies that you mentioned, the, the Wolbachia or the other GM mosquitoes that do not carry gene drives, the, which are uh, self-limiting technologies, let's say, uh, it clearly says that those technologies could be used as comparators for some purposes. And, and therefore the, the, the EFSA is uh, clearly saying, and, and I concur, that uh, these other technologies are different. It's not the same, uh, a self-limiting ordinary GM mosquito and, and a gene drive. The, 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 um, but uh, they could be opening the door, opening the door to consider other, other technologies, biological technologies to control uh, mosquitoes uh, aside from, from insecticides. And, and I think it's the other way around too. The, Oh, oh, everything that is being discussed on G many things that are in documents uh, about gene drives may help uh, regulators to deal with um, other technologies to control, let's say, mosquitoes using non non not gene drive not gene drive uh, uh, mechanisms like ordinary GMO, for instance, in the issue of comparators and and mathematical models and statistical tools, things like that. Uh, whatever, whatever is developed for gene drives will certainly benefits, benefit the assessment of, of the other products. And yeah, it's interesting you have a, that it's a two-way street, I, I guess, in terms of experience. Um, Jeff Turner asks, following yeah. up someone on the discussion of training Given the well over a decade of training initiatives under the United Nations Environment Program post Cartagena implementation, focused at the country level for countries that had not seen any GM applications, do you see value in stronger support for technical advisory bodies at the regional level and the pursuit of appropriate regulatory reforms to recognize these bodies in national legal frameworks? This could be this could better leverage appropriate expertise more broadly at a regional level and be more sustainable longer term. Well, uh, I, uh, that, 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 that's an, an interesting um, uh, contribution because I, I think what we can learn from that is that 
uh, currently um, there shouldn't be a, a window of opportunity, uh, for instance, from the chef to fund any country that raises the, their hand and say we, we need capacity building. They, they should uh, prioritize or focus on those countries where there is an, an actual possibility of uh, the release of a chain drive. So, I mean, this, these funding bodies should work with the developers and, and, and get information from the developers uh, on, on what they see as the potential target where they are going to deploy or, or apply for deploying the, their technologies first. So once again, the, the lesson there is um, not just funding any country because they are a regulator that has the opportunity to travel or the adequate contact says, I, I want capacity building on this, uh, but the other way around. Me, me, they should meet with developers. Developers may say it, it's about this particular country because they have malaria. It, it's about this particular country because it has this, uh, this rodent control problem. And then make, make funding available to those countries where the, up, where the developers are going to apply first. Thanks, Martin. That's uh, good insight. Dave Abarkta asks another question. Um, the fact that an open tri field trial of gene drive organism may, may not be different from deployment seems to present some challenges to regulators and decision makers. While models will be needed, what else do you think developers will need, will need to get decision makers comfortable with the release? Well, <clears throat> um, the, the, it's along the lines of the, the things that I is um, market as capacity, I think, capacity building needs, I think. Mathematical modeling, as, as, as David said, of course, uh, also tons of information about the biology, the system, the, 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 the insect, the, the, the ecosystem, and a, a very solid proposal for post-market monitoring. Because the, the thing here is that we're not going to have the intermediate step of field trial. For, for certain chain drives, it's possible. Uh, of course, we, you, you can have nested field trials, but uh, they are not uh, so, so, so significant or not so informative of what could happen in, in an open release. So the EFSA, I'm saying this very coarsely, but the EFSA is anticipating like we are, we are going to, to jump from mathematical models and, and nested um, um, uh, field trials to actual releases for at least some kinds of field of, of gene drives. And, and therefore, the, 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 if the mathematical modeling is very strong, the information gathered about the biological system is very, the, the, bio, the biodiversity and the biological systems is very strong. And the post-market monitoring is, is also strong. And that, that, will, that will be the elements that may convey more, more confidence to the regulator for for giving the step of, of uh, endorsing a, an application. What about um, information or proposals for mitigation? Are there any types of mitigation measures that you think might be more attractive to a regulator to consider? Probably for, for, for certain kind of gene drives that can be the, can have like a, some sort of self-limitation, it, it may be possible. The, the EFSA document is, is also detailed about that. But the, there is a risk there uh, that if we go too much along that direction in terms of guidance and, and, and discussions about the topic, that we may end up uh, blocking the development of other kind of gene drives. We, we could have some, some sort of some, some configurations of gene drives that may be very effective uh, but if we stress too much on those other options that may have some sort of, uh, of, uh, of recall or, or attenuation, um, we, we, may, um, we may mislead regulators to prefer that and not accept the others. I, I think there should be room for filing application and testing all kinds of shin drive technologies, even those that are less... Um, uh, stoppable after release. Well, I think that 
brings us to the end of our questions. And I think this is a very lively and very interesting set of questions for us to consider. Thank you so much, Martin, for your interesting talk and, and also for fulfilling all this, uh, these interesting questions. So please join me with people on, online for a thank you. And um, I also want to rec uh, remind people that the next um, webinar will be on October 28th. And there we'll be talking about relevance of risk assessment in other disciplines for the risk assessment of gene drives. We'll have Michael Bonsell for Oxford, from Oxford University and Owen Edwards from CSIRO in Australia. So thank you everyone. Thank you once again, Martin, for, uh, for joining us today and for providing us with some very good insights on the, uh, the, on the regional approaches to governance of gene drives. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity.